critical contests. Voters in six states go to the polls. Why the stakes are so high in today's primary races. Changes in the Vatican about how the church deals with claims of clerical abuse. What's happening to make sure the process is fair for all. Plus, we chat with a top Israeli diplomat about Pope Francis's trip to the Holy Land and recovery after disaster. How people in Oklahoma are doing one year after a deadly tornado struck. Those stories and more just ahead on EWTN News Nightly for Tuesday, May 20th, 2014. Good evening from Washington. I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for joining us tonight. Looking at news now, the polls will soon be closing on this biggest primary day of the midterm election season so far. Voters in six states are casting ballots, including Arkansas, Georgia, Idaho, Kentucky, Oregon, and Pennsylvania. Now, two of those states are critical in the struggle to control Congress. In Kentucky, Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell is fighting to keep his seat. And in Georgia, a nasty battle in the Republican camp could mean the GOP nominee won't be as strong going into the general election against a big-name Democrat in that state. Our Wyatt Goolsby takes a closer look at what's at stake tonight. Brian, there are battles going on across the country, from Democrats, Republicans, to even non-establishment Tea Party members. Now, as you mentioned, one of the big showdowns is in Kentucky. Businessman Matt Bevin is challenging Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell. Now, McConnell has always been expected to cruise to victory in today's race. He has many mainstream Republican organizations backing him, but Bevin is the anti-establishment candidate. He's received support from many Tea Party groups, and one group, the Senate Conservatives Fund, based here in D.C., spent about a million dollars in support of Bevin. McConnell has the name recognition, though, and today's election is setting him up for that general election in November. Today, House Speaker John Boehner didn't take a side in any primaries, but he did talk about the increasing role of the Tea Party. Listen, I think uh, the Tea Party has, has brought great energy to our political process. You get in these, uh, these primary elections, uh, they're, uh, they're hard-fought battles. It's not big, that big a difference between what you can all call the Tea Party and a, your average conservative Republican. You know, we're against Obamacare. We think taxes are too high. We think the government's too big. Meanwhile, the other race we've been watching nationally has been in Georgia. On the Republican side, five candidates have divided the vote, not only among their party, but with conservatives in general. Phil Gingry, Paul Brown, Jack Kingston, Karen Handel, and David Perdue. In the last few days, voters in Georgia have seen daily attacks between candidates, and some of them pretty ugly. Take a look at this video from David Perdue and a response from Jack Kingston. The decision in this election is very simple. If you like the results coming out of Washington right now, then pick one of these four professional politicians. It really won't matter because you know nothing will change. Meet Davey Perdue. He's been distracting you with babies, but he's the one who's made a mess. Something doesn't smell right because the change he wants stinks. It's all but certain this race will head to a July 22nd runoff. The winner will likely take on Democratic nominee Michelle Nunn, daughter of Senator Sam Nunn, well known in Georgia. So while in many cases we have seen some crowded elections, it's also fair to say we've seen some competitive ones. Brian? All right, thanks. Our Wyatt Goolsby at the Capitol tonight. Elaine Carmack, or Kmark rather, is with us and with the Brookings Institute, blogs at, blogs at domestic politics and governance. So what do you think is most significant about today's primaries, Elaine? Well, the big headline is, of course, Kentucky, because Mitch McConnell is the Senate minority leader. Um, if the Senate turns and he keeps his seat, he'll be the majority leader of the Senate. And he's in trouble. I mean, he's not only got a strong primary challenger, although most people think he's going to win, but he's actually in trouble in the general election against a young Democratic woman named Allison Grimes. And I think that surprised a lot of people because when, when one of the leaders of the House or the Senate can't hold their own seat, then, you know, people pay attention. That would be a huge blow for the GOP to lose that election. It would be a huge blow. I mean, ironically, right, they could lose that election and still pick up the Senate, but it makes, certainly makes it harder. And I think that McConnell's troubles are kind of indicative of the undercurrent that's in the electorate about the Republican Party itself and whether or not they're up to governing. Boehner kind of dodged some questions about uh, the Tea Party. What role is the Tea Party going to play this year? 
Well, it's a mixed role. I mean, they are contesting a lot of primaries. In our studies that you can find on FixGov at the Brookings website, you can see that most of the challengers in the Republican races are Tea Party sympathizers. So that's sort of the good news. They're out there, they're contesting primaries. Good news for the Tea Party people. The bad news is they've yet to win. They ju they're just not winning. They're not winning these high-profile Senate races that they're contesting, and they haven't knocked off any incumbents yet. Now, Idaho t tonight could be one of the first ones, but so far, uh, they're not doing very well in the elections. Quickly, what do you see on the Democratic side? Any interesting races there? The most interesting one is Pennsylvania where the Republican governor is very vulnerable and there's a very hotly contested primary for who's going to take on the Republican governor. All right, Elaine K. Mark from the Brookings <laughs> Institution, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you for having me. We appreciate you being back. Now, some of the other stories our EWTN News Nightly team is covering in today's world. Those fighting to redefine marriage chalk up another victory today. A federal judge in Pennsylvania overturns a state law there which says marriage is between one man and one woman. Twelve other federal district courts have made similar rulings. The Pennsylvania governor's office tells News Nightly that the governor and the chief counsel for Pennsylvania are reviewing the ruling to try to map out their next step. Also, the U.N. Security Council may take a big step in the fight against terrorists in Nigeria. The council could impose sanctions on Boko Haram, the group responsible for the recent mass kidnapping of Nigerian schoolgirls. The sanctions would make it harder for Boko Haram to get weapons and move its money around. A diplomat reports that the Nigerian government asked for the sanctions. If no one on the Security Council objects by Thursday, the council will add Boko Haram to its sanctions list. Also in Nigeria, bombers strike the central part of that country. Police say at least 46 people are dead after two bombs exploded at a bus station. They haven't confirmed yet who's responsible. We'll continue to monitor this latest violent attack. The church's war against clerical abuse has a new soldier tonight. Pope Francis has just appointed a bishop from his native Argentina to the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. Archbishop Jose Mulligan will be responsible for hearing the appeals of clergy members accused of serious violations of canon law, including sexual abuse. Vice President Joe Biden begins a three-day trip to Romania and Cyprus. Today in Romania, he's asking European allies to stand with the U.S. in punishing Russia for its actions in Ukraine. That includes the annexation of Crimea and the occupation of Ukraine's east. The vice president also plans to meet with both American and Romanian troops. They're working together right now on a special joint exercise. Biden will later visit Cyprus and meet with political leaders as well as Orthodox and Catholic officials. Speaking of Russia's annexation of Crimea, there's deep concern over its impact on Ukraine's military. Naval leaders say it is putting them in a tough spot. It might be hard to spot, but tucked behind storage tanks and large cargo vessels is Ukraine's Navy fleet, or what's left of their fleet, since Russia annexed the Crimean Peninsula two months ago. With two-thirds of their vessels lost and an army desperate for equipment, Ukraine's military is facing its worst crisis ever. Times are not the best for the fleet now, but it's also trying to spread its wings. Western allies, including the United States, have shown little willingness to help them rearm for fear of provoking the Russian military even further. Ukraine's defense ministry has taken to hustling 50-cent donations that people make with mobile phone text messages. Many families had to come here and we had support and help from the local authorities and many volunteers, and it gives us inspiration. Formed after the 1991 breakup of the Soviet Union, Ukraine originally thought it didn't need a large navy as Russia would remain a friendly presence. Russia's actions left Ukraine's fleet reduced from 75 ships to just 28, but Ukrainians remain hopeful. If you talk to the crew members, they would tell you, we'll reconstruct the ship. We'll do it. We're ready. It proves that the spirit is invincible. Russia is slowly returning some of the ships it seized, apparently dismayed by their poor condition. And Ukraine's presidential elections are this Sunday. A deadly, rather a deadly train collision near Moscow killed six people and injured 45 others. The accident happened after a cargo train derailed and hit a passenger train. Several cars overturned. There were conflicting reports about the cause. One official said it was due to a crack in the rail. Another said a cargo container came loose and hit the train. 
Britain's Prime Minister is calling for the streamlining of rules for extraditing suspected terrorists. David Cameron's comments come a day after a New York jury convicted Mustafa Kamel Mustafa on 11 charges. That Islamic preacher was on trial for supporting terror from a London mosque. He fought extradition to the U.S. for years, delaying his trial. Serbia's government is announcing a three-day period of mourning after massive flooding left at least three dozen people dead and forced a half million people from their homes. You can see these rescue workers helping people evacuate. This is the region's worst flooding in recorded history, and the death toll is expected to rise. Now there's a new concern. Drowned livestock pose a serious health hazard. Authorities are warning residents to drink only boiled or bottled water. Some former NFL players are filing a lawsuit claiming the league gave them illegal painkillers. They say those painkillers simply masked serious problems, things like broken bones. Among the players behind the suit are Hall of Famer Richard Dent and former Chicago Bears quarterback Jim McMahon. A spokesman for the NFL, NFL rather, said the league has not had time yet to review the suit. Cyber war. China is sending a powerful message to the United States after those landmark charges we told you about yesterday. Our Jason Calvi joining us now with that story. Jason? Well, Brian, China is now turning the tables on the United States, now calling the U.S. the biggest attacker of China's cyberspace. As we told you last night, the U.S. has charged five Chinese Army officials of hacking and then stealing trade secrets from U.S. companies like U.S. Steel and Westinghouse. Now China has a warning. China is warning the U.S. that military ties may be jeopardized. They say the charges cause serious damage to mutual trust. This after the United States charged these five Chinese Army officials with hacking. A Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman said the United States is twisting reality. He said the U.S. has violated basic principles of international relations with this indictment. These represent the first ever charges against known state actors for infiltrating United States commercial targets by cyber means. Chinese officials say the military and government have not hacked. They're demanding the U.S. take back the charges. One analyst says it'll be difficult for China to stop cyber spying, but the U.S. had reason to speak out now. So far, the cost, the loss from cyber espionage has been outweighed by the benefits of access to the China market. And I think we're reaching the point where that isn't true anymore. And China has already stopped its teamwork with the U.S. on a joint cybersecurity task force. Brian, we'll see how else these uh, charges might chill relations with China. This is going to be an ongoing story. Thank you, Jason. Coming up, there's a hidden business that often pops up at big sporting events. Now the Vatican is getting involved and will tell you about the concern. And he's not D.C.'s most eligible bachelor, but a high school student still wanted a date with a high-ranking politician who she wants to take to prom. Welcome back to EWTN News Nightly. It's good to have you with us. I'm Brian Patrick. On Tuesday, May 20th, Pope Francis will soon arrive in the Holy Land. Our man in Rome, Alan Holdren, sat down with Israel's ambassador to the Holy See to discuss the Pope's trip. Take a look. There is much anticipation and excitement in Israel uh, for the visit of Pope uh, Francis. Israel is, regardless of their religious affiliation, are expecting uh, the visit of the Pope. He will be welcomed uh, very warmly uh, with an open heart as a very uh, honored uh, guest of the State of Israel. And can Pope Francis help the peace process? The Pope uh, is a man of peace and he will bring with him a message of peace. Religious leaders, uh, spiritual leaders uh, can sometimes uh, uh, ease a tension between two sides to a conflict. They can create more trust and build uh, bridges uh, to peace. Uh, the message of peace that Pope uh, Francis will bring will certainly uh, have an impact. Thanks to our Alan Holdren in Rome, and we look forward to your coverage of the Holy Father's pilgrimage to the Holy Land. Catholic and Anglican ecumenical experts are working together on issues like the role of lay people in the church. They just finished a 10-day meeting in South Africa, the fourth of its kind. Vatican Radio is reporting the group made progress on a statement about authority in the church. The members of the group also visited local charitable projects, including an AIDS center. 
Well, along with sightseeing and soccer matches, visitors to the World Cup this year may learn about human trafficking risks. Catholic leaders announced the campaign against yeah. human trafficking at the Vatican yeah. Press yeah. Office today. Yeah. They hope to help people recognize what goes on behind the scenes at big events like the soccer tournament. Pressure is mounting on the Sudanese government to overturn the death sentence of a pregnant woman who refuses to renounce her Christian faith. Senator Kelly Ayotte of New Hampshire wants to the Secretary of State to grant Miriam Ibrahim political asylum. Senator Jean Shaheen, also from New Hampshire, says the death sentence is a violation of fundamental freedoms. Ibrahim's husband has ties to New Hampshire. He is a U.S. citizen. The couple already has a two-year-old son. Daniel Burke is joining us, editor of CNN's Belief blog. He's with us tonight. Is the case in Sudan unique, or is this going on more often than we'd like to think? Well, it is going on more often than we'd like to think. Uh, the, a lot of international organizations, rights groups, take a look at religious freedom around the world, and there, it seems like every year there's one or two cases of this popping up. In Saudi Arabia, a couple of years ago, there was a man who was accused of, of wizardry, of all things, of, of practicing witchcraft, and he was executed. So this does happen. It's fairly rare, but it happens more than anyone would like. Is there anything that can be done about it? Well, international pressure, like you mentioned, one from, from the senators. There is also, in Sudan, for example, there's a court of appeals. Uh, it looks like the religious law and the country's secular law are a little bit at odds. So this woman's lawyer, uh, Ms. Ibrahim's lawyer, does think that on appeals there's a good chance that she will win. She was raised a Christian woman. Uh, she was born to a Muslim father, but she was raised by a Christian mother when her father left the family. So he seems to think they have a pretty good case, at least in this particular instance. So she's accused of apostasy, which means she left the Muslim faith to become Christian, which doesn't seem to be the case at all. Right. That's exactly her argument. She says she was never Muslim. She told the court she was never Muslim. And they even gave her a chance to renounce her Christian faith and she wouldn't do it. So. You know, she says a, she's a Christian. Apostasy essentially doesn't apply in this case. Daniel, you wrote recently about religious persecution. How do other countries compare to Sudan? Well, Sudan is definitely one of the worst. The U.S. State Department puts out a, a report on international religious freedom every year. They put seven or eight countries of particular concern. Sudan has been on that list since 1999. It's enforces Sharia law, a harsh interpretation of Sharia law. Some countries also use Sharia law, but not the same kind of penalties for theft. There would be amputation. Women are sometimes flogged for what they call indecency. So Sudan is one of the top violators of religious rights, but there are others as well. How do you measure religious persecution, for that matter, religious freedom? That's a tough one. Uh, I think the State Department and others measure it by how free are people to worship, uh, to believe what they wanted to believe without being thrown in jail or persecuted. And all of these cases, we're talking about the government that is doing this. So it's not like vigilante groups or anything like that. These, these policies are coming from the top, and that's part of what makes them so scary. It is frightening. Daniel Burke, thanks for joining us again. Thank you. Up next. The roof was completely gone. Walls were completely gone. There were cars in the hallways in between. We tracked the recovery one year after the Moore, Oklahoma tornado. Then, a high school heartbreak, the celebrity who turned down a teen's invitation to prom. On EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick, and those of you who live in the nation's middle section are certainly no strangers to tornadoes. But what blew through Moore, Oklahoma, one year ago today, was one of the deadliest in that state's history. EWTN News Nightly's Laura Cole takes a look at how people in Moore are recovering, even as they continue to heal. Rebuilding is not a choice for this city in America's heartland. A year later, Moore, Oklahoma is still recovering after a deadly tornado ripped through here. Memories still fresh for many of the survivors. Turn on the news and they were telling us that it was going to be severe weather. And it was going to, I didn't think it was going to be like that. Mm hmm. What did it sound like? Just a lot of wind and popping ears. Kai Hung Persuth was at Plaza Towers Elementary School when the tornado carved through his hometown and his school. So for them to see me walking up the hallways and down the hallways with the seriousness that I was carrying with me, um, they knew 
some, that this was real. The school didn't have a storm shelter, so the principal and teachers did their best to keep the children safe. When I looked down the hallway, the roof was completely gone, walls were completely gone, there were cars in the hallways in between kindergartners and pre-Kers. Seven children died during the storm. That loss still looms. We try not to say tornado around here. Yeah. Just the word um, scares some of them. In the immediate aftermath, the town came together. Moments captured in photos like this. My first one was like, my second one was like that. Like I'm inhaling on my first picture and then exhaling on my second. The fire department, they uh, were actually able to uh, make a, a small hole. They broke out a few of the center blocks uh, right next to where the, the kids were at. Officer Travis Mullenweg helped pull Kai out of the rubble. And uh, started pulling him out, and uh, that's where I was able to help, and that's where I guess the first chance I met uh, Kai was at. He doesn't like being photographed. While Kai doesn't like talking about the storm, he does open up about the brand new Plaza Tower School he'll attend in the fall. Yeah, it's humongous, the school. Included in the new school, safe rooms designed to withstand tornadoes. Laura Thank Cole, EWTN Nightly News. Thank you, Laura. There's been a push in the wake of the tornado for more storm shelters at schools. Oklahoma School Superintendent Janet Baresi says she is for school safety, but each district should decide for itself whether to use shelters based on the individual needs of that community. Well, six people are grateful to be alive after a scary boat ride in the state of Washington. A yacht rolled on its side Sunday night just north of Seattle as the boat was coming off a ramp into the water. The water started pouring in and people inside had to climb to the high spots and those outside broke windows using rocks. Crew members say the boat stabilizers hit some rocks, but it could have been much worse. Well, the Coast Guard says two people were taken to a nearby hospital after that accident. Well, could the price of your cup of joe be going up? The government wants to keep that from happening. There's a devastating coffee disease hitting Central American farmers. It's called coffee rust. The U.S. announced a $5 million partnership with Texas A&M's World Coffee Research to eliminate this plant disease. So far, the damage is estimated at more than a billion dollars across Latin America. Scientists have found huge dinosaur bones, possibly the largest ever in Argentina. They think the animal weighed about 176,000 pounds. Researchers have already uncovered the fossils of seven other dinosaurs. Experts began digging in that area earlier this year. And a Connecticut high school student had big plans when it came to her prom date. Talia Maselli asked Vice President Joe Biden to go with her to the prom. She wrote him a letter calling him the most delightful man in America. She even had a little fun with it, saying if he didn't take her, she might have to ask House Speaker John Boehner, a Republican. Well, the vice president wrote her back and sent her a corsage. And I thought it was a practical joke because the guy gave me a corsage and that letter and said that the Secret Service told him to bring it to me. Well, Biden wasn't able to attend the prom with Talia, but Biden's office is arranging to have the two meet in July. First Lady Michelle Obama hosting children this afternoon for the White House Talent Show. Groups from across the nation got to tout their talents. They were good. Actress Sarah Jessica Parker made an appearance and, oh, by the way, the president even stopped by briefly. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Tell your friends we're on five nights a week, so join us tomorrow. In the meantime, be sure to like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can catch us again anytime on EWTN's YouTube page. For all of us here at EWTN News Nightly, I'm Brian Patrick. Thank you for watching tonight. Good night and God bless you.